everyone. Um, my name is Łukasz Koliński. I'm a head of unit for renewables and energy system integration at the European Commission uh, in the Directorate General for, for Energy. I will have the pleasure to chair uh, today's session on the skills in offshore development. I would like to say a few words, set the scene on why it's a question which is very pertinent from our perspective, from the perspective of the, of the European Commission. As you may know, we have a provisionally agreed reinforced and modernized renewable energy directive, which we hope will enter into force later this year. One of the key objectives, key targets of this directive is to give or take double the renewables share in our energy mix within eight years. This is very ambitious, but it's also a huge challenge. If you look, if you zoom in on offshore, we see this as a sector of renewables where probably there is a, the highest growth potential among different renewable technologies. When you see what happened so far with offshore in Europe, and when I say Europe, I include the EU, Norway, and the UK. According to the International Renewable Energy Agency, we have together around 30 gigawatt of offshore already installed. That's more or less as much as China has. And then when you look at the rest of the world, it's almost nothing. So we have a very unique starting point, unique, unique position. Second, we have seen recently a very strong political momentum behind offshore development. You have seen all these conferences, all these meetings, summits with uh, heads of states and governments, and in which the European Commission obviously participated. They agreed to accelerate the offshore deployment by far. You know, three years ago when we prepared the offshore strategy in the European Commission, we counted on around 60, 60 gigawatts of offshore to be deployed by 2030. When you add up all the declarations of the member states that we see now, we are double that, 120. So, huge ambition, but where are we now? Well, last year we installed, give or take, two gigawatts. Two. And we need to get to 120 if we are to fulfill this ambition. So there is a huge gap to be filled. That's the first reason why it's super important from the point of view of the Commission. The second reason is because in Europe we have strong manufacturing sector in offshore. And almost half of the active companies in wind sector and that includes the components, but also foundations and cables, almost half onshore and offshore are located in the European Union. And obviously, when you add the first deployment challenge to the second manufacturing challenge or manufacturing situation, you immediately run into a very, very big question. Do we have enough skills? Do we have the workforce, the skilled workforce? In 2020, we had roughly 77 thousand people working in the offshore wind industry across the whole EU. We see some estimates that within the next five years we will need 20 or even 54,000 people more in this sector. So we already see that the companies are facing skills gaps or skills shortages. Overall, two-thirds of companies in the sector are signaling these issues. And obviously, this is why, as the Commission, we have taken up this, this issue with the stakeholders. And, and it has been growing, in fact. Um, and therefore, you know, we've discussed the question of skills with the stakeholders in the Clean Energy Industrial Forum, which helped us to move decisively on the legislative agenda. And I mentioned already the Renewable Energy Directive, which pushes the ambition, pushes the the de deployment and delivery of, of renewables, including offshore. And then the other 
Leg uh, legislative act that I would like to mention that the Commission proposed earlier this year is the Net Zero Industry, Industry Act, which actually is promoting European manufacturing in renewables but also in other industries relevant for achieving net zero by 2050. We have other initiatives which are focused directly on skills, like a blueprint for sectoral cooperation on skills, sectoral sector skills alliance. Two years ago, we have established uh, the partnership for offshore renewable energy under the Pact of Skills. And finally, I would like to mention that all these initiatives can be linked to funding. There is a lot of funding under cohesion policy, under the Recovery and Resilience Fund, which can be used across the member states in order to shore up the skills of the, of the workforce uh, in this sector. So I will stop here. We will hear much more from our distinguished uh, speakers. I would like to, to introduce our panel. I'll start with Ivan Pineda, Director of Innovation in Wind Europe, Agnieszka Rodak, CEO of Rumia Invest Park and representing the Pomeranian Offshore Wind Energy Competence Center, Niels uh, Erik Clausen, Associate Professor uh, from the Department uh, of Wind and Energy in the DTU, I understand that's Danish Technical Institute. At university. University, sorry, indeed, of course. Audrey McIver, uh, Director of Energy and Low Carbon at Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Uh, and Atle Blomgren, Senior Researcher in Norwegian Research Center. Um, before I invite the speakers here, I would like to, to invite all participants uh, in the room, but also online, to connect to Slido, and you have the QR code on the screens. The Slido will be used for first replying the to questions that I will ask to everyone, and second, you can also use Slido for questions at the end of our session. I hope that we will have some time uh, for this. So the first question uh, is, Today, as I mentioned, we have 77,000 workers in Europe working in offshore wind. And the question is, how many people should be working in the sector to deliver projects to reach 110 gigawatts by 2030, up from 15 gigawatts in the European Union? Today, the answer <laughs> will be given by Ivan. Ivan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you and um, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the organizers of uh, this session. Um, my name is Ivan Pineda. I work for Wind Europe. I'm the director of uh, innovation. Can we have the slides up please? Excellent. And I would like to talk to you um, about this topic of offshore wind uh, and, and skills and how can we harness uh, the potential of offshore wind to actually uh, also promote the skills that we need to, to the energy transition. Um, Wind Europe is a trade association uh, representing the entire value chain of wind energy producers, manufacturers, component uh, manufacturers, but also research institutes, universities, uh, as well as the entire uh, consumers that have a stake in wind energy, plus the national associations that help us to drive a lot of the uh, work that we do at national level. Today, there is uh, 255 gigawatts of cumulative capacity of wind energy in Europe. The charts uh, that, uh, that you see here uh, th basically shows the amount of capacity per country. You can clearly see countries like Germany uh, or the United Kingdom or even Spain with very, very high shares of capacity installed. But for most of the people, not like me, that I live day and night with gigawatts in mind, what it means is 17% of our electricity that we consume every day is coming from wind energy. And when you look at that on a country level, well, the story looks slightly different. With countries such as Denmark, uh, that you cannot see here in the screen, but actually it's uh, covering about 55% of their electricity needs through wind energy. 
and about a quarter of the electricity needs in Spain as well are covered by wind energy, the same amount that in Germany. So one of the big um, progresses that we have made in wind energy is exactly that, achieving a larger and larger penetration in the electricity mix and the consumption that we have for this, um, uh, endemic, um, uh, this indigenous resource in Europe. So what will be the challenges that we will face if we want to achieve the very ambitious targets that now the European Commission has provisionally um, uh, agreed with member states as well as with the European Parliament? Just to give you in context, it's been agreed that 42.5% of renewable energy need to come and need to meet our final energy demands. If we translate that into wind energy, that will be about 420 gigawatts. I think I lost no. 420 gigawatts in the next eight years. So yes, it is indeed um, uh, almost doubling or a little bit less than doubling uh, that capacity in the next eight years. And the first challenge that we have is that actually we get to get this done fast. It's about speed. We need to be installing more wind energy than the one that we are installing today. We are about half of the way that we need to be installing of wind energy. So this will bring uh, significant challenges because we not only have to develop skills, the skills that we need um, uh, for, for the installation and the manufacturer, we need to do that fast. And this comprehends jobs that are going to be throughout the entire value chain. So we need to pass from around 300,000 jobs in the entire wind industry, 77,000 of them in offshore wind, as Lukas mentioned, to 450,000 jobs in 2030. Almost 200,000 jobs will be exclusively for offshore wind. So that's the answer to the slide of poll, 200,000 jobs. And we have all the elements um, to actually do it because the benefits for Europe are going to be significant. Today, the wind industry contributes to 42 billion euros to the, uh, to the EU GDP. And that, if you translate it across the entire value chain of on and offshore wind, that's more or less to say that on average, every new turbine contributes to 13 million to the EU economy. That's on average for on and offshore wind. But when you zoom in to offshore wind, actually, the value creation that we have is even larger. Offshore wind, every new offshore wind turbine could generate about 20 million euros of economic spill over um, uh, contribution to the economy. And this contribution comes from jobs in factories that we think uh, they will require a significant amount of increase. This is a picture of a blade factory in the UK in which um, is one of the most labor intensive so uh, activities in the manufacturing of wind energy. Uh, wind blades uh, are going to be requiring a lot of automation, but they will require a lot of inspection and testing as well. So we need the, the skills uh, that actually are going to be able to produce on a mass scale the number of new blades that we will have in the future. We will also require jobs in construction if my slide works. Um, and very important when it comes to jobs in construction is um, the element of ensuring that we have a huge diversity. One of the key aspects of increasing the skills is to tap into, um, into more women at work. Construction jobs traditionally are thought uh, to be male dominated, but construction is something that we will need to start thinking about how can we adapt our activities at sea and on land to also be uh, able to be attractive to women. Um, I lost my slides, but I will continue nonetheless. There will be also jobs in logistics. So we not only need good that is able to manufacture and to install, but also people that is good at planning and looking at what are the challenges that we are going to uh, have to move very large components. And that includes uh, jobs in logistics for onshore, but also, particularly for offshore, is the jobs in ports uh, that you see here a picture. So the entire value chain is needed in terms of the type of jobs, in terms of planning, in terms of value chains creation, in terms of designing. And we need to think about that this job creation is in most, in, in most of the uh, areas that are coastal areas uh, that traditionally have hosted uh, very energy intensive 
uh, industries, and in some cases they have been left behind. And this will bring, bring us uh, very well to the, um, uh, to the topic of the just transition, because we do believe that offshore wind energy will have a significant role in the just transition in those areas that have been left behind in coastal areas. And we are working on the blueprint for the partnership on offshore renewables through a project that is called FLORES. It's a very nice acronym in Spanish, but actually is uh, meaning uh, forward looking to the offshore renewable energy. And what we are trying to do is to map out all the current offering of um, skills offering that we have in Europe, in universities and research centers, and try to match that out with what we need in the, uh, in the industry. So we are going to do that. We are going to produce some uh, training material that as well uh, will help to create awareness and attract professionals from other industries also to the offshore renewable uh, industry, as well as create a skills observatory that is able to monitor how we are getting on with the progress of all these uh, initiatives. This is a project that is uh, funded by the European Commission. It has 15 partners from across eight countries, and uh, we have just started this year, and, and we are very happy that we are able to contribute in mapping this out. And let me give you also another example, particularly in Poland. Uh, we are collaborating with an uh, organization that is uh, in charge of EDU Offshore Wind. This is a fair in which uh, students are bring, are bring uh, uh, in close contact with industry to actually acquire certain skills and be interested in, uh, in the offshore wind. Offshore wind in Poland is going to grow significantly. We are seeing extremely great progresses in the way that the industry is going there. And through this partnership and through these initiatives, we are able to tap into about 5,000 students that could have a different way of uh, engaging in industry, particularly in a country that is very uh, intensive in the use of coal and moving it towards uh, offshore wind. And last, I want to give you a, an overview that also we are collaborating with the Renew Academy in uh, North Romania. This is an academy that helps uh, coal miners uh, to reconvert into um, renewable energy and distributed sources by giving them training in electrical engineering, but also in uh, health, and health and safety. The particular challenges that we have in skills for offshore wind are very much related on the day-to-day -day work, and in some cases for technicians, we need to have certain certifications so that are able to actually execute their job at sea the safest as possible. We are here to create jobs, but also we want to make sure that the people that are coming to our industry are very well trained and that they are able to actually execute the job in the safest possible way. I'll leave it there and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Ivan. Actually, a very quick follow-up question to you. Uh, you presented very well the, the benefits and what you are doing in order to, to reap these benefits. But, uh, you know, what would be one advice from you to the businesses, to the authorities and to the training centers on how they could align in order to, to, get to, to address the challenge that we're looking into? One advice one big advice and then of course we can discuss later i think the first of all is we need to start talking more and more with each other there mm. is a lot of initiatives out there we are trying to map out everything that is happening out there because if we if we think that we are starting from scratch we are not going to make the progress needed i mentioned about speed and it's all about the speed and there is a lot of work already going with all the social partners that we have here in, on, on the stage, but also I know that at national level there are tons of priorities <coughs> and tons of activities already doing. So let's come together, let's collaborate, let's exchange the information because I'm sure that there is a lot already going on and perhaps we don't have to start from scratch. Partnerships. Thank you very much. Agnieszka, I would invi invite you now to give us the presentation of your uh, competence center. Uh, thank you. Can I have the slides, please? Well, hello, everyone. My name is Agnieszka. I'm representing uh, the municipal company of Rumia, Rumia Invest Park, and also, as it was mentioned, the Pomeranian Center uh, of uh, Offshore Wind Competence. And even thank you for mentioning Edu Offshore Wind as a good example, as we, as Rumia, were one of the organizers. So thank you for that. 
uh, Pomeranian Offshore Renewable Competence Center is very much connected to the new um, economy sector that is going to happen in Poland. It means uh, building offshore wind uh, in Pomerania region, uh, which is going to be ready in 2026 or 27. And uh, the competence center will, will be located in, um, in Rumia. Rumia is the city in Pomerania in northern Poland uh, between uh, the future installation port for offshore in Gdańsk and operational and maintenance um, ports in Ustka and Weba. So what are the challenges in Poland for developing the new economy sector as it is really something that we need to develop? Uh, we have in Poland the shortage of skilled workforce uh, and that's why uh, we need to create the centers like uh, ours in Rumia uh, to put mon more emphasis on skills de development. Uh, and another problem is that we have the low, um, lo low interest of youth in vocational education. They, they still think it's something worse than universities and higher education levels. So uh, we need to deal with this a lot. Uh, and uh, what is more, we need to train the teachers uh, as they uh, still have the lack of knowledge about uh, the new economy sector. Uh, we need to spread the knowledge amongst them and train them more. And of course, what I mentioned before, uh, we, ha we have no well-equipped practical training centers in Poland. Uh, so, uh, the answer to the challenges is, of course, the Pomeranian Offshore Renewable Energy Competence Center, the project of the city of Rumia and uh, the regional authorities of Gdańsk, of the Pomerania region. It is one of the strategic projects of the Pomorskie Development Strategy 2030. What are the main function of our center? The, the, um, the first function is the umbrella function. It means that it is going to connect all the activities uh, that are devoted to offshore wind development in Pomerania, uh, because there are a lot of activities right now, and investors don't really know where to go and what is going on. So the center uh, is going to be an umbrella, uh, gathering together all the initiatives. Of course, training, uh, training function for vocational education level for students, and uh, co coaching for adults. Uh, we are also going to create uh, the conference and office space and do the research and development together with our universities. Uh, it was mentioned here that uh, now uh, it is 77,000 uh, jobs in, uh, in Europe right now in offshore wind. And the research, uh, the research say that uh, in Poland we will have the demand for 77,000 new jobs. Uh, connected to offshore wind development, so it's a lot, and half of them will be in Pomerania. Of course, there are jobs; they are jobs in the whole value chain, but still, there are a lot, and there will be a demand for uh, about 35,000 new trainings, and most of them will take place in Pomerania region. So, to prepare ourselves uh, for uh, for elaborating the project of uh, Pomerania Center Competence Center. Uh, we took a more look at what we have on the vocational education level in the region. We divided our professions that we have into four sectors, four fields, and uh, the two most important for us are the fields, the jobs, or the professions which are directly related to offshore wind and with training potential uh, in offshore wind. These are uh, two on your right, I think. Yeah. Uh, and if you see uh, at all the professions in Pomerania on the vocational education level, uh, you will notice that job directly related to offshore wind energy uh, sector and with training potential are over 50% of all the professions that we have in Pomerania. This is not a bad result, but we still need to develop it. So what have we done so far as a center? Uh, we are, we are the um, We are the, the member of Polish offshore sector deal document. I think this is the second document on national level in Europe after the Great Britain's one. Um, and also we have uh, very strong cooperation with universities, especially with uh, uh, Technical University of Gdańsk. 
um, the students of architecture department have designed the new district in Rumia involving the function of the Pomeranian Competence Center. And we have published the book uh, which shows the visions, the idea of the students. This is a very interesting uh, published um, book. We are also constantly present at schools. Um, last school year, we have visited eight primary schools talking about offshore wind with our partners, Polenergia, Quinor, and uh, also we have visited 60 high schools as a part of Edu Offshore Wind uh, Career Fair that Ivan mentioned about. And next uh, school year, we are going to visit another 15 schools, uh, high schools uh, and uh, primary schools talking about offshore wind with cooperation also with Polenergia Equinor. Edo Offshore Wind, I'm not going to repeat it, but it was a big success. I think it was the best, uh, the biggest of this kind educational event in the Baltic Sea region uh, devoted to offshore wind. So we had over 6,000 visitors. Uh, involving mostly high, high school students. We had over 80 uh, exhibitors and partners, many volunteers who helped us, two stages, one for business, one for youth, and uh, many interactive attractions for students. So we warmly invite you to join the second edition of Educational Careers Fair that is going to take place in March 2024. So to sum up, because I'm, I think I'm short of time, uh, to sum up, what are the conclusions and recommendations? First of all, we need to create uh, financing mechanisms uh, to, uh, for supporting the centers which are devoted to uh, developing the new uh, economy sectors. This is uh, something that we really need to think about. We need to also um, put more emphasis on e English learning trainings at schools because offshore is English. Uh, we have to train more teachers and also spread knowledge about offshore wind about among uh, the, the students to, uh, to make vocational education more attractive for them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agnieszka. Also a quick question, if I may. Uh, yes, I may. understand your... <laughs> You're cooperating with local authorities, and you mentioned that you mentioned that there is a first a wider strategy in which uh, of, of which you are part, and also that I saw the um, uh, the mention of the fact that what you're doing might become an impulse for the for the development of the city. So the question is, how are the authorities of the city, local authorities, perhaps even central authorities, involved in, uh, in this project of yours? Well, first of all, uh, I would like to say that uh, energy transition is a very important topic, not only for Rumia, but also for the, the whole region. Uh, today we have with us our deputy mayor of Rumia, Mr. Piotr Widbrod. Could, could you please show yourself now? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so it shows that it is really important for us. Um, uh, we as Rumia are also the initiator and the main partner of Pomerania uh, offshore platform. This is the body which is supervised by the Marshal's Office of Pomorskie. Uh, and it connects uh, business and uh, universities, local governments, to make the common plan of business development, on, um, uh, of skills development, uh, uh, and also uh, put more emphasis on environment protection. So this is what on the regional level is going, going on. And uh, one of the initiatives of the platform was also Edu Offshore Wind, as the Marshal's Office was the partner. But uh, uh, as we are talking about the city development, uh, we in Rumi are going to be uh, energy independent city in a few years. Uh, that means that we are going to be a producer of energy, not only for our uh, institutions, uh, but also for uh, our companies. Mm -hmm. Mm, and it also needs uh, the skills development. Uh, as a uh, self-governmental institution, we also are responsible for mm, the local zoning plans. Uh, it means that we, ca we can create a good environment for developing uh, or attracting new companies to the city by, uh, by uh, special, let's say, attractive uh, local zoning plans for, for the new investors. Okay. So I think these are the most important things. Perfect. Thank you very much. And now let's move on to our next speaker, Nilseri Klausen, who 
will present to us on education of engineers. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. And thank you very much for the invitation to come here today and uh, talk about, oh, it looks like I have a lot of time now, uh, <laughs> uh, to talk about what we are doing to help a little bit our little small contribution to filling this gap. Uh, and also, it's very important, I agree with the previous speakers, that we do this together. But I will talk about, since we're a university, I will talk about education of engineers for the offshore wind sector. And first of all, we have our full-time educations. And here is just some examples. We are educating engineers. Uh, the first step is a bachelor degree, which takes three years. Second step, a master degree, two years. And the third step, for some few ones, uh, to take a PhD degree. And we have approximately 100 PhD students working entirely with wind energy, not only offshore, but wind energy as a uh, total. We have a Bachelor of Sustainable Energy. We have since 2002 have a Master of Wind Energy, which is one of the first in the world. Every year we are educating about 100 engineers uh, with a Master of uh, Wind Energy. We also have Master of Science in Sustainable Energy Systems and Sustainable Energy Technologies with a study line in wind energy and then in collaboration with TU Delft, University of Oldenburg and NTNU in Norway, we are also part of the European Wind Energy Master. So we have quite a lot of different, uh, and this is our full-time education uh, examples. So, um, but we are also in, engaged in reskilling of people. And this is where part-time education comes in, because all of these are full-time ed educations. We have a very large international diversity there. I think every year I count around 30 different uh, nationalities uh, where people travel to Denmark, study and stay for two years. But the full-time education program cannot be utilized by everyone. That's why we have created a part-time program, which is 60 ECTS credits spread the world o over two to six years, where you can follow either the entire education or selected courses. And the requirement for permission is a bachelor degree or higher and minimum two years of relevant working experience. So what you can do if you follow these uh, courses, either some of them or all of them, is that you can take your career, if you're already in the wind industry, to a completely new level. What we see is that many engineers working in a narrow sector in the wind in industry, they want an overview over the entire sector, maybe to make some career changes. And about half of our students are actually transitioning from into renewable energy from oil and gas or shipping. So that's the mainly two types of students that we have uh, in, this, uh, in this program. Since 2017, when we started this program, which is, by the way, accredited by the Danish government, we have had more than 200, uh, 200 students enrolled, and many of them also, of course, graduated. And they are, as you can see on the image here, distributed wi within a wide range of time zones. This is something we can do with online education. Uh, the students don't have to travel to Denmark, but they can actually follow the education in the country where they live and still have their family and their job uh, in, and juggle with all these uh, three responsibilities. It's a, it's a challenge. Um, they have a variable experience in the field of energy. Some uh, are completely newcomers and others have already worked in the wind industry for some years. The courses that we offer uh, so far are um, actually uh, in the spring semester we have these six courses aerodynamics and elasticity wind energy in society this is how can we create as much value as possible to the society by wind energy both onshore and offshore we offer courses in grid connection hybrid power plant hybrid means pv and wind uh, operating together and then as a relatively new one uh, offered for the first time this year, offshore wind farm planning course, where I'm the course responsible. And we already the first year had 34 students signed up. Finally, uh, you also do a final project in the Wind Energy Master, which where you have supervision uh, on a weekly basis with one, of, with one supervisor. And the spring semester runs from February to May. The autumn semester runs from September to, to Christmas. 
And uh, there we also have uh, the one I have circled here. We have a dedicated course in how to design substructures, how to design monopiles structurally for the offshore wind sector. The other courses also contains, of course, elements relevant for the offshore wind industry. For instance, wind resource, you need to know that. Materials is also important to know. Numerical tools and wind turbine technology and measurement techniques. So all of it is relevant for offshore, but the one I have circled is dedicated to offshore wind examples. What does it mean to learn online? Uh, what we do is that we have made some high quality uh, video lectures that are recorded, each of them approximately 10 to 15 minutes. So you can uh, follow the video lectures, you can fill in some quizzes, calculation exercises and assignments. And for the assignment, you get uh, personal feedback from the teachers. Once uh, every week, you meet the teacher online in online Q&A sessions and webinars. And for the final project, you will have a one-to-one -one supervision for uh, three, four months. In August every year, we have a physical event where we invite all our students to come to DTU. Uh, on the left-hand side of the picture, you see two of the students graduating. So that's the graduation ceremony. You have to defend your thesis coming to DTU physically. That's the only requirement we have about physical presence. But we also invite all the students in the program to come and network together, meet the teachers and the future supervisors of their project. So that's uh, every year quite, uh, quite popular. And then they get a tour of our research facilities, as you can see uh, on the picture. So finally, um, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, there's a link here to the program. Uh, and apart from, from this, we also uh, contribute with a free online program, a uh, free MOOC, where we have so far have 152,000 students uh, signing up. Because this one is a commercial program, but the free one is kind of a starting point if you want to see what it is. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Neil Serik. Do you monitor the, the graduates in terms of employability? Do they get jobs quickly, those who are full-time? Yes. And, and where? I mean, yeah, in, that's a very in good their question. countries, in Denmark? That's a very good question, uh, Lucas, because uh, the Danish government is also concerned about that because full-time education in Denmark is free if you are coming from a country in, in within the EU. So that's why we have to prove every year to the government that the investment they do is, is, is good. So we monitor that carefully. Approximately half of the students uh, stay in Denmark for at least uh, five years and work in the wind industry. And this is way more, uh, creating way more value than what we invested in the students, mm -hmm. social, uh, society-wise. Understood. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay, before we move to, to the next speaker, we have another slide of question for you. Can I ask for it to be put on screen? Yeah, this is forward, the green. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what, in your opinion, is the biggest bottleneck of offshore wind development for meeting the target uh. for 2030? lack of adequately educated workforce, lack of enough suppliers in the supply chains, too slow permitting procedures, lack of sufficient funding, and then um, lack of or more competitive conditions for offshore investors outside the EU. I'll wait a moment for the critical mass of answers to, to come online. There is no one correct answer, so <laughs> feel free to pick up any reply you want. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Nobody okay. can see the butterflies. It seems that although the permitting procedures are considered a big issue, they are too slow and indeed we've been we've been addressing this this problem. We we are here mostly convinced that the skills gap is is the main issue very well let's move on um, i would now invite audrey 
who will present on the role of skills to deliver Scotland's offshore wind ambitions. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for the in, um, introduction. I'm um, really delighted to be here today um, and to really consider the opportunities that, and challenges that we all face in our transition to a net zero future, and particularly the role that offshore wind has to play. Highlands and Islands Enterprise is Scottish Government's economic and community development agency for the northern half of Scotland. We cover, in my opinion, a special and spectacular geography from Shetland in the north to Argyll in the south and from the Outer Hebrides in the west across to Murray in the east. Our population is just under 470,000 people and like Scotland as a whole, we currently face a population challenge, declining birth rates, reduction in mi migration and depopulation. The challenge, particularly rural, population is particularly acute in the Highlands and Islands. So what can we do about this challenge? Well, creating new exciting and long-term employment opportunities are a big part of the solution and I believe that offshore wind has a huge role to play. Before going on to talk about that a bit further, a bit about me and my role. I've worked in economic and community development in the Highlands and Islands for almost 30 years and half of that time has been on energy and low carbon. We've worked on really pioneering projects with industry and partners, some of you in the room today. Um, particular projects have been around the European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney, the Mage End Tidal Energy Array in the Pentland Firth, and the establishment of Wave Energy in Scotland. And we've also enabled significant port development over the last decade, with total public and private investment in excess of quarter of a billion in preparation for offshore wind. And at Highlands and Islands Enterprise, we enjoy working collaboratively with the other two economic development agencies in Scotland, Scottish Enterprise and South Scotland Enterprise, and also Scotland Skills Agency, Skills Development Scotland. And we do this no more intensively than in offshore wind. The past 18 months have seen a seismic shift in Scotland's offshore wind sector, with two new leasing rounds delivered by Crown Estate Scotland. Scotwind and affectionately known INTOG, Innovation and Targeted Oil and Gas Leasing Round. This is dramatically increasing Scotland's offshore wind project pipeline to 45.5 gigawatts. The Scotland leasing process awarded development rights to 20 projects with a combined capacity of up to 28 gigawatts. The Innovation and Targeted Oil and Gas Leasing Round offered rights to a further 13 projects with a proposed capacity of 5.4 gigawatts. And Floating Wind is a significant share of these projects, offering new manufacturing opportunities, potentially well suited to our country's deep water ports, large laydown areas, our North Sea oil and gas experience, and close proximity to the projects. The construction of these projects could not only transform Scotland's energy system, but also shape, reshape Scotland's renewable energy industry. We must, however, build capacity and capability in several key areas, including our supply chain, our port infrastructure, and skills, if we are really going to secure the economic value of offshore wind. So Crown Estate Scotland introduced the requirement to produce and update annually supply chain development statements within each of the lease awards. And this is giving us a real rich insight to the new industrial opportunities for Scotland. In delivering 28 gigawatts of capacity, developers have committed to 28 billion spend within the Scottish economy, around 14 billion of which would be in manufacturing components, cables, mooring, anchors, blades, substructures. The floating wind opportunity is new and exciting, but not yet fully understood but with the prospect of around 1,000 floating substructures being manufactured over the next decade, there is clear, clearly significant scope for business diversification, transfer of existing skills and expertise, and for new entrants to the market. Within the Highlands and Islands region alone, we see potential for further seven operation and maintenance bases, providing year-round employment for decades to come in some of our more rural, small communities and already experiencing strong international interest in establishing manufacturing facilities. 
Such interest has the potential to create an estimated 4,000 jobs in the Highlands and Islands Enterprise area, but that's perhaps a conservative estimate. Just last week, the Offshore Wind Energy Council for the UK forecasted a workforce of over 104,000, up from the current UK workforce in the offshore wind sector of 32,200. I guess we've already covered just the scale and the pace at which we're going to have to grow this industry. There are real challenges to realising those opportunities. It has taken us in Scotland 15 years to build two gigawatts. The next 15 years, we have a target of an excess of 20 gigawatts, so it's 10 times as much. I think that illustrates clearly just the scale challenge. Other challenges around technology and floating wind is still relatively immature technology with significant variations in design, materials, etc. Project timelines are quite uncertain due to permitting, highlighted as a potential constraint, but also to grid, to vessel availability, and potential pinch points that we see in delivery schedules. Later this decade and early into the next is showing particularly hot for building out and commissioning of projects. And the grid to transport all this power from offshore wind is quite likely to be a rate limiting factor. The National Grid for the UK projects a £54 billion rollout of its holistic network design, but that needs to proceed at pace, almost a wartime footing, um, to enable the offshore wind to be connected timely. And also our port and our supply chain capacity has constraints. But clearly, and highlighted just there a moment ago, it's the skills and the available workforce that is re um, continually um, um, mooted as a real constraint on, on realising this opportunity. This chart from the North Sea Transition Deal Integrated People and Skills Strategy illustrates further the anticipated growth in the offshore wind sector, along with hydrogen and CCUS. It also shows the anticipated decline in oil and gas and why it is so important to focus efforts on transition and clear pathways into the industry ensuring we fully harness the decades of experience and make sure that our transition to net zero is indeed a just one. It's also clear that in addition to retaining and transitioning people, attracting new people is going to be vital for this offshore energy industry. The anticipated rate of growth in the sector needs to be accompanied by upskilling of existing employees, supporting the transition to the sector and ensuring long-term pathway through apprenticeships, further and higher education for new entrants. And ensuring diversity and inclusivity from the outset is absolutely critical. So, in terms of anticipating the growth and the, and the headline of level of growth is, is particularly exciting, and daunting. How do we ensure that the right skills are available at the right time? Who delivers? Where does the investment come from? And can our education and skills institutions meet the demand? A key challenge for all is dealing with the uncertainty of what will be required when and how best to meet that demand. Whilst we have some certainty around the types of skills required for operations and maintenance, we also recognise that operation and maintenance approaches may differ in, um, as projects become further from shore. And also we have uncertainty around the manufacturing skills that will be required. I mentioned the variations within floating wind structures, for example. Is it concrete? Is it steel? So what type of skills are required for that? But I think what this um, slide illustrates is that the real need for sustained and deep engagement with developers with industry and for data and intelligence to be shared for the training infrastructure, be that colleges, universities or indeed private sector who's responding to this opportunity to be agile and responsive. What we already know though is that there are immediate shortages. High level electrical skills, digital skills, including data analysts, scientists, engineers with an understanding of data analysis, consenting skills and particularly I am short, uh, short supply amongst the regulators and also within the industry, contributing further to that permitting constraint, and also marine and port orientated skills. And over the medium to longer term, the following skill shortages are anticipated. Electrical, technical and engineering skills, likely to be exacerbated because there's competition for those skills right across the energy system. Project management the ability to manage significant size projects and multiple contractors, 
is going to be a real, um, a real challenge. One offshore wind farm is greater than Scotland's Queen's Ferry Crossing, which was once described as Scotland's biggest infrastructure project in a generation. Yet we're going to have potentially 20 plus of these infrastructure projects. Mm. So on and offshore logistics will also be in short supply and the construction resource for floating wind, requiring high numbers of people in fabrication and welding. So what is Scotland's response? To date, it's been a combination of national, regional and local approaches with collaboration between industry and government. For example, Skills Development Scotland had produced the Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan and that had a focus on inspiring and empowering young people to engage in the transition and to, to support upskilling. That Skills Action Plan has been informed by the Energy Skills Alliance, the Scottish Offshore Wind Energy Council and is supported by Energy Skills Partnership and National Energy Skills Accelerator. We also have in Scotland the Scottish Offshore Wind Energy Council, which is a co collaboration between industry and government, and one of the groups focuses very much on skills. The areas of work that the, the group focuses on are attraction, recruitment and, and retention, education and engaging young people, diversity and inclusion, a focus on critical occupations such as wind training, fabrication and welding, composites, Collaboration through clusters, such as our Deep Wind Cluster, which operates quite internationally. Also a focus on place-based solutions and local delivery, which I think is particularly important. And also to continue the data collection through pro initiatives such as the Skills Intelligence Model. We believe that local, further and higher education is hugely important from an accessibility and inclusivity perspective but also from a regional economic impact, as evidenced by our University of the Highlands and Islands, a dispersed model throughout our region. So just to focus on a couple of, a couple of areas, excuse me, go back, um, a couple of areas, my slide's not coming up now, sorry about that, um, it's going to focus on education and young people, there it is. Um, we're running with Science Skills Academy in the Highlands and Islands, and it's really providing broader STEM engagement um, across our schools. Renewable energy um, is a fantastic module, is a fantastic introduction to the sector for secondary schools. And since 2020, over 2,700 young people have been exposed to this. And it has quite a significant focus, focus on wind and offshore wind. It provides ready to use resources and training for primary and secondary teachers. And it really is um, getting positive feedback and we're really keen to try and roll this out and reach every school in the Highlands and Islands. Another place-based solution is around, um, an example is the Energy Transition Zone in the northeast of Scotland. And it has a skills plan for the northeast, which is particularly important given the heavy reliance of the oil and gas industry uh, in that region. Programmes include an energy skills accelerator, which is collaborating between universities, college and the energy transition zone, and with sponsorship from organisations such as Shell and Scottish Power. Also looking at further wind turbine training scholarships and, and um, advanced manufacturing skills hub. An energy skills outreach going out to classroom, bringing this um, classroom on wheels effectively. And there's also includes a pipeline pledge, which is really enc encouraging the industry to really commit to supporting the, the skills agenda. So in conclusion, Scotland does have the potential to establish a world-class offshore wind sector that underpins the transition to net zero. But a, well, a wealth of experience and transferable skills exist, but significantly more will be needed across the full project life cycle for offshore wind. A campaign combining talent attraction, transition training and sector attractiveness actions is needed nationally, regionally and locally. But totally recognise that the challenge is not unique to Scotland, nor indeed to offshore wind. So collaboration is critical. So together, let us enthuse our budding young wind farmers and realise this once in a generation opportunity across the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much, Audrey, and we will move on directly to Atle uh, on, uh, on the presentation from Norse. 
Tim, <coughs> uh, yes. Yeah, my slides. So my name is Atle Blomgren. I'm a researcher at NORS in Stavanger. And I'm going to present the uh, results from a project. Uh, how do I go farther? Is this, is this one? Green. The green. green. Ah, the big but green. <laughs> So I'm going to uh, I'm going to show you some results from a big project we're running as Norse with the universities of Bergen, Stavanger and Kristiansand. Agder, see over there. And the title of the presentation is, is a is about building an offshore wind workforce and then lessons from Norway. Uh, just brief about the project is a project of about 5 million euros uh, over 6 years. Uh, with the four uh, Norse and three universities, and as you see, uh, many of the big players in the industry. And as you see, these are not uh, not Norwegian companies. Most of them are, are also no Norway-based, but not definitely not Norwegian. You have Shell, you probably know Mainstream, and, and Equinor. Good. Uh, just a few words about the no uh, Norwegian offshore, uh, uh, or shall I say, the Norway-based offshore wind industry. Because that's actually, uh, you could say, four different things. First of all, we have offshore wind suppliers supplying offshore wind in, in other countries. Like this, the, the first picture of, uh, is from Abel and Haugesson, uh, making substations. Secondly, we uh, use offshore wind in the oil and gas sector. That's for power. The Hyben Tampen project, you might be, you might know, it's the first floating offshore wind park in the world. That's uh, that's powering off an oil and gas installation. Then we have Norway-based companies working with offshore wind in other countries, like in Scotland. High wind Scotland is run from Norway, based on on, on uh, our own High wind Tampen in Norway. And fourthly, we have open areas also in Norway on the NC NCS, the Norwegian continental shelf, as you see in the picture, two open areas and and a lot more that could come in the future. Those two areas are open now and the licensing will be in August and there will be some results in by the end of the year. But uh, there was a question now about the biggest problem uh, facing the offshore wind industry. And that is probably uh, this. It's probably it's not skills. It's, it's actually it's actually costs. And this is not a Norwegian thing. Uh, Equinor just dropped a big one gigawatt project in Troll Wind, or Trolls was dropped. The the Dogger Bank project in the UK is probably not. It's probably in the red with the current costs and the high interest rates. And on the Right, you see the cover of uh, see this morning's cover of the biggest Norwegian um, business daily, saying that Equinor and, and BP, so to say, will need more subsidies. Also in New York, the pro for the projects Empire Wind Two and Beacon Wind, we probably uh, need more subsidies from New York State. So that probably at the moment, it, uh, I would say, is probably uh, the, uh, the biggest challenge, at least for the moment. Uh, we need to talk about oil and gas because Norway is a big, is a big uh, country within oil and gas, and that started in '65, almost 60 years ago. And then we uh, built on our capabilities within shipping and also uh, within manufacturing. And the economist said it turned Bergen from a fishing village into an industrial hub. They obviously mean my hometown of Stavanger, but that's a different story. But anyway, Norway uh, built on shipping. Uh, shipping, uh, 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 shipping uh, 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 and also manufacturing to go into oil and gas. So, have you got what it takes to uh, go into offshore wind? I'm building now on a report we did for Vorgrön, a company that's uh, uh, it's not it's Norway based, but uh, it's a foreign owned by, by for, uh, uh, from Italy, or by Eni, and high tech vision for Norway. First of all, Fact one, the core disciplines within offshore wind are basically the same as within oil and gas. This report uh, from the UK is widely used, saying that 90% of, of the skills are, 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 are quite similar, the oil and gas and offshore wind. Fact two, it's a multidisciplinary. That has been said in also, in also, also today. Some examples, we need, uh, you, need, you need ICT to digitize installation operations. Artificial intelligence uh, for uh, bird monitoring, for instance. 
you, ne you need to understand the win. The University of Bergen is very good. It's world class when it comes to, uh, it comes to uh, wind studies. Meteorology studies. You need a marine biologist to study effects on marine life. Is there a prod problem for marine life at offshore wind? And then you have to distinguish between fish, uh, 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 be between fish and between fisheries, which are uh, connected but not the same thing. And finally, you need lawyers to understand permitting and financing. And you need social scientists, so you, you won't have the effects, as Norway has seen, the, the, the conflict with the Sami people. The Sami people who have, uh, have uh, uh, rebelled against land win. And then, fact number three. The, as an oil and gas, the vast majority of workers with offshore wind uh, will be what we in Norway, in lack of, a, of, a, of an English term, uh, is called skilled workers, uh, Fagarbeiter, Facharbeiter in German. That term doesn't exist in English. So, so people today uh, talk about the different term and uh, technicians uh, of the future, but uh, skilled worker is the best term I can think of. And in Norway, Norway Fagarbeiter. These have a vocation training of two years and an apprenticeship of two years. That means they have uh, four years of training. These are uh, very respected. Some even have a point here. So a technical college uh, in addition. And 44% of all workers in the Norwegian oil and gas sectors are, uh, do have vocational training. And that's the bulk of the workers we will need in offshore wind, since it's so similar. And then about capacity, the big problem is that unemployment is so low. <laughs> this is a problem now. There is a, there's no available capacity. In Norway, it's 1.8% unemployment, and that's almost nothing. In practice, it's zero. So how do I... So I think I should go back to... If you can, yeah. if you, if you, if you can go back three slides. Okay, we go here. So to sum up, uh, when it comes to building an offshore work wind for force, I'm going to point to six, six uh, concrete solutions, or uh, possible solutions. First of all, the industry lacks uh, offshore wind, uh, offshore wind uh, 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 practical experience. The disciplines are the same. They should know it, but they have never done it. So they need some kind of reskilling. At North, with the Universities of Bergen, Agitra and Stavanger, two weeks ago, we did a summer school in offshore wind. Gave them a basic, basic uh, course um, about uh, uh, the basis of offshore wind in four days, about wind resources and forecasting, offshore wind uh, technology, law, finance, supply chain, and also coexistence, social, yeah, and also also environmental. We had uh, people from most of Norway, but also from, from, from foreign countries, Iceland, US, and also Poland. And it's the companies and the people who participate are mostly people from the industry. And it was also taught in English. That's one good thing, uh, brief, uh, brief reskilling. And these are not people who are unemployed. These are uh, well and paid uh, people working in the oil and gas industry, seeing that in the future they will gradually go into offshore wind. So it's not about oil and gas people losing their jobs. They have jobs, but they want to go into offshore wind in the future. Secondly, there are some competencies we lack, and then we need to establish and ramp up new programs that could be within vocational training. This is a project funded um, by the European Union, uh, T-Shore and Ecosun, uh, about training, uh, training a wind service and technicians. Secondly, uh, capacity. There are three uh, solutions for the problem of capacity. Use existing programs, since the disciplines are almost the same. You could use the same programs, but uh, they should focus on offshore wind applications, like Isvan Ahmad on the picture, who focused on offshore wind. Uh, did a master's in, in marine and technology, but focused on offshore wind, and is now working in, in IKM ocean design, partly with oil and gas and partly with offshore wind problems. Uh, secondly, about capacity, there's been talk about these skilled workers, Fagarbeiter, Fagarbeiter. These jobs uh, should, should, should be, uh, should be uh, popular, attractive. That means 
the company should demand formal qualification and, and, and they should also uh, pay well. Because uh, these are the people we need. And about capacity, another concrete example for Norway, uh, you could uh, do upskilling of the unemployed. This is a concrete project in Norway where unemployed are, 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 are given a course in, uh, uh, to work as a wind service technician. And the course is subsidized by the government. And finally, uh, you also uh, need, need to uh, work in together. So, so in Norway, the Minister of, um, of Oil and Gas and Energy, Tai Oslan, has set down a forum where he has gathered universities, industry, and the government to actually work together and talk about the skills. What skills do we need? Which programs do we need? Thank you. Thank you very much, Atle. So, I have a very quick question. The oil and gas companies make bumper profits. Equinor in the red. How are you convincing those people to, to move from one place to another? Yeah, uh, uh, this, is a, this is a good question. I think the thinking in Equinor is that the future uh, will be a renewables. In the future, it'll be. They have to do it eventually. So, uh, so they're starting now, gradually. Mm. Thanks a lot. Okay, so that uh, gives us the full overview of our speakers. Uh, I would ask another question on Slido, please. On the, let's put it on the screen. Which level of education must be developed first to realize offshore wind projects after all these insights that we have heard? Let's see what the what our audience <laughs> thinks. We cannot see. No, we cannot see. The keys. Oh, they have to come. Okay, I I see that indeed, as was as was already mentioned, there is quite a lot of importance put on reskilling from the current from the industries that are currently, let's say, dominating, as well as combining all kinds of education. And I think that you know, with the with the challenge we face, definitely. All three of, of those would be necessary, as, as is indeed the, the opinion of the majority. Ivan, having heard all these super interesting presentations on different cases from different countries, and having heard you not only outlining the benefits, but also the enormity of the challenge, are you? Optimistic. I, I, I think we are optimistic. I am optimistic. When I mentioned that there is so many activities already happening, and each participant confirming that they are already thinking about, okay, we need to map what we need. And the next one, oh yeah, we also need to map what we need. And everybody else, yeah, well, we have, we know what we have mapped and what we need. I think the collaboration element is going to be extremely important because every single region, every single. Um, country will want to have a benefit from offshore wind. And they will have it, but we will go faster, and perhaps um, we, will, we will be more effective if we are able to learn from each other. Um, I, was, uh, I was particularly um, interested in the case of, 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 of Scotland, and, and as well as the, 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 the case of Poland, that perhaps is the very first time for these countries to actually, they are looking at developing a completely new industry mm. for offshore wind. It's the first time that an authority needs to plan for an offshore wind. It's the very first time that a, a, an investor needs to set up um, a manufacturing or an investment park for offshore wind. It's the very first time that a student will want to graduate um, for uh, wind energy. 
and, and this is very exciting. And I think you, don't, you are not alone. And you can learn from many of the things that are happening already because there are countries that have gone through that process. And I think that to the extent that we are able to connect, uh, that's, the, that's the extent that we are going to be able to make things faster. Mm -hmm. While our audience can put the questions on Slido, uh, and I will take them in a moment. One more, one more question to, to actually all the panelists, because building on what you said, in some countries, you're, you're basically building this from the scratch. And you're building it in a situation where either you face depopulation or you face almost uh, full employment. So I think Agnieszka mentioned this question of teaching the teachers. Mm -hmm. How do you teach the teachers in such situation? I can understand that teaching the students, giving them the perspective, you know, you go out there, you install all these gigawatts. That, that is something that, that is very attractive. Teaching the teachers, what's the, what's the challenge? What's the, the good reply? I can have a go. And then somebody else. Sure. I think, first of all, I'd like to repeat that uh, collaboration is essential. And uh, actually, uh, last uh, autumn I was in Gdansk uh, teaching offshore uh, wind for the, uh, the students. We tried to set up a teaching the teachers program, but since they started a master education at the Technical University of Gdansk, we didn't have time to do that. So I had to teach the students directly. But we are working on that. And we're working on it uh, by establishing a twinning project. Uh, EU have a program where two universities experienced together with a developing university, so to say, uh, go together. And then we train the teachers. And this one, this we are working on presently with the University of, of Gdansk. We also have a similar project with the University of Cyprus, uh, which will start uh, at the end of this year, where we work together for six years and try to establish a regional center of renewable energy uh, at Cyprus, kind of a center in, in that region. Mm -hmm. So I think working together with, with universities across Europe is, is very important. May I add Any something? Sure. Uh, I think that uh, the European Commission's support also is important in teaching the teachers' pro process because we are now, for example, waiting for uh, good news in our application where teaching the teachers is one of the main elements. We are doing that on based on uh, German uh, experiences. And this is something that we really need to focus on. So, uh, of course, uh, I'm happy to hear that you were in Gdańsk and doing the teaching the teachers. Why didn't I know about it? <laughs> <laughs> now you know. <laughs> <laughs> As we, we, we used to meet each other every week. So, <laughs> uh, But uh, sharing experiences, working together, I think, also uh, is the answer to your question. Yeah. Thank you. Audrey. I was just going to say that um, we're addressing this. I mentioned the Science Skills Academy, and that's a route through which we can engage and reach into the teachers um, with people based locally. Um, but also another couple of initiatives are um, we're engaging with a social enterprise who's operating throughout Scotland in terms of really trying to motivate and inspire young people either in school or in their early careers and encouraging a real collaboration around key themes or industry challenges and you know offshore winds included within that. Um, so it's getting that sort of partnership working a bit across boundaries if you like as well. And my last other uh, last point is around the role of industry. Um, we're already seeing a commitment from many of the offshore wind developers in, in Scotland um, engaging with universities and eng engaging in the outreach to schools and um, particular initiatives forming again through the likes of the University of the Highlands and Islands. So I think it was just to sort of, again, comes back to collaboration. It's not for one agency or you know one organisation to really tackle this. It, it definitely needs that collaborative approach. And there's just so much more we can continue to do to motivate and inspire. I think the advantage we have in Scotland is that some of the projects now are operational. So we can almost see them from shore and some will be going further offshore, obviously. But we have um, real examples of communities that are benefiting and workers that are living and breathing it. And then they can tell that story and it sort of filters through to friends, family, parents, peers as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that there's also a, an important thing, a link between the permitting process uh, 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 and also skills. Because in Norway now, there is a, there is out there, this two areas open, and the, all these companies are, are applying for licenses. And then when they apply, they need to, they need to, they need to make an application, and then they have to uh, to state whether they are working with, with schools and universities. So uh, they should be should be built into the plans to uh, force them if they don't want to. They have to. It's not that simple. In Norway, it's been done in the oil and gas sector for 50 years. <laughs> okay. And uh, and it's not it's not said uh, uh, it, it's not uh, it's not a necessary requirement. But they understand they should and they do it. Thank you. A quick question. I mean, there was a lot, uh, a lot of discussion about reskilling mainly from oil and gas sectors to, to renewables. Um, I wonder, Agnieszka, you know, d do you see any reskilling from, let's say, mining industry in Poland to, to renewables, and also, and also, which is linked to it a little bit. Is there a role, is, is there the impact of the central government policies, you know, the overall kind of embracing of renewables as the future of, of energy uh, in, uh, in what you're doing? Is, this, is there an impact? How do you know about coal miners? <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking. <laughs> okay, yes, you are, you are perfectly right. Uh, uh, we have the whole sector of uh, my miners in uh, Poland that needs to, to be f forced, maybe, to do the reskilling uh, because uh, there are lack, uh, lack of jobs uh, in, in the uh, southern part, part of Poland. But the problem here is that uh, the coal miners should need uh, to feel they want to relocate. Uh, from the southern Poland to the northern Poland. And it also means relocating the whole families very often. Mm. And uh, this is the bar barrier, I think, in their thinking. Um, another point is that uh, we have the national, on the national level, some programs uh, which finance the uh, reskilling process amongst the, um, mi coal miners. But uh, last year there were 17 persons participating 17 <laughs> so uh, I think we still need to change their way of thinking about relocating to attract a relocating to them more mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, another sector is the uh, fishery sector that we need to deal with also in terms of uh, um, rescuing mm -hmm. so this is in Poland yeah perfect thank you very much um, I see that I mean, I would take some questions from the audience, but they have just disappeared, so I would ask the organizers to bring them back. But one question I remember. Our panel is almost, almost equal in terms of <laughs> gender. The question was, <laughs> the, question, the question was, you know, what's the role of gender equality? Or, I mean, let's put it very bl bluntly. I mean, these jobs so far, I believe, mostly attracted men how to attract more women into, into the sector? And that's a question to everyone, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ask me. <laughs> Can be, please. Uh, yeah, I think it's, a, it, 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 it's actually a big problem. Because as, 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 as we see it, it's a, a very similar to, uh, to oil and gas. And there's also a male dominant sector. So I think it's the same problem as in, in the oil and gas. So yeah. It's a challenge, I would say, but no a clear cut answer. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can add a little. Um, it's about uh, examples, I think, very important. We are very much aware of that uh, at, at the university. So we participate in many programs in schools and in gymnasiums, trying to make uh, the girls interested in um, mathematics, in STEM uh, things very early because sometimes it, it we can't wait until they have to decide their education it's sometimes too late mm -hmm. so we have to engage ourselves early in school and then we are also very much aware that our female professors because we do have two or three of those uh, which is not half it's below but we promote them much more than the uh, male professors 
So as a way of examples for the girls. So if you go into engineering education, you can actually end up being a professor at the <laughs> university. It's very important that we promote it actively. Perhaps I can add, and the easiest of the answers is, well, let's ask the women what is that they will need to actually become more attractive uh, <laughs> to the, uh, to, to more attracted to the, uh, to the offshore wind. And we have done that. We have asked, you know, um, uh, the colleagues, Female that are working in the offshore wind industry, what will it take, you know, bringing more women actually to the sector? And for many of them, um, I'm not generalizing, but for many of them, the fact that some of these work we communicate them, we we market them as, oh, you're going to be far away from home for a month, <laughs> maintaining turbines in high sea, rough seas, you know, with another 50 men in a vessel. <laughs> Tell me who wants. From, from the women to be in that position. So it's, mm. it's, it's very difficult and we need a lot of work, you know, to be done. And a very simple answer that uh, someone gave me once is like, well, I will start just for having enough toilets in the vessels for women. Audrey, is that? Is yes. that <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, I'm affected. quite encouraged by the audience. It's actually more <laughs> female, I think. So that shows the interest. <laughs> so we just want to convert that. Um, I think... I guess there's something for me about, um, in terms of how we approach this industry, it's um, not just about the gender diversity, but about being fully inclusive. Um, and really, um, you know, um, within our organisation, we have a, an approach around fair work, and anything we support has to um, meet those fair work criteria. And that is all about ex accessibility and inclusivity and across gender, across, you know, full diversity there. Um, so I think we approach it from, from that way, but absolutely, um, I guess a really good point around is just ask what are the small practical things that can be done just to make it that bit more um, accessible. I do think in terms of the careers in offshore window, we've not just to narrow it to thinking it's about on the um, work boat going out to the turbine. This is it's a, a fascinating industry from the sort of scoping through to the decommissioning. Um, so there's lots of opportunities onshore as well as offshore. So I think it's about thinking it in the widest sense when we think about inclusivity. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I see a question on the transfer of best practices from from the markets where uh, where offshore is, let's say, more established to, to other markets. We already touched upon it. We talked about university to university cooperation. We talked also about European level, European level uh, partnerships. What else, what else do you think is important to be mentioned in this context? Exchange of best practices. Perhaps here, one element that is important is the mutual recognition of trainings and certifications between countries. Mm -hmm. And this is where, mm -hmm. for example, so it would be very welcome the European Commission help. Um, Again, uh, anecdotically, um, if, if a Polish worker wants to go and work in an offshore wind farm in Denmark, he will have to go through a two weeks retraining. Because mm -hmm. whatever he or she has learned in Poland may not be accepted in Denmark for actually going offshore. So how, how can we leverage those um, uh, learnings? Well, perhaps also working with governments and authorities so that there is mutual recognition in the training and certification. Thanks. Audrey? Yeah, I agree with that. I think um, in terms of efforts to develop an energy skills passport to make it sh you know, considered in the widest sense and to ease that transferability, um, I think so, you know, cross country, but also across different occupations in the offshore energy space. I think if we achieve that, that will, um, you know, really give us a, a really good start, you know, in terms of that transition. Any other views? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, I think there's a question about the distinction between, between university education uh, uh, and also vocational training because the university is it's quite standardized already. So what we're talking about now is actually vocational training. And I would think from a Scandinavian perspective, maybe we would be not that willing to have a kind of lower standard, so to say, if I could say it so bluntly. So, because we had this, this, this uh, requirement of two years of schooling and two years of, of a, a apprenticeship. So we would like to have the same standards all over. So yeah, that would be an issue. And for the Norwegian labor unions, that would also be an important issue. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah. And I think, may I add something? I think that there's one th- uh, threat in uh, uh, applying or transferring best practices from the m- more uh, developed countries, more markets. It, it means when the Polish worker will see uh, the salaries in, the, in these markets, will not want to stay in Poland anymore, as uh, he or she will be a more qualified worker. So, uh, of course, we should transfer best practices, <laughs> but as we in Poland need to have more uh, workforce, uh, we need to do it wisely, I think. Mm-hmm. So, not to lose these, uh, these new workers, more qualified workers, by showing them how attractive the sector is in other countries. Mm-hmm. Agnieszka, <laughs> building on, on this end, and uh, that will be the last question that I will take. How to ensure that whatever you all do, those people who are indeed highly skilled, they stay in the in Europe, in the European Union, but also in Norway, in the UK, vis-a-vis, you know, going going elsewhere. And uh, as we as we discussed, currently we are at the forefront of the offshore development, but we hear announcements not only in the European Union or or more widely in Europe, but also, for example, from the US. So how do you ensure that they stay here, those people? I can, my view is that we cannot, and we (laughs) should not, because the the climate challenge is global. So I think, uh, as you could see from the map I showed, we have people from all over the world. And uh, what we see, uh, following up on your question, Lucas, is that as we are happy as long as the engineers stay <coughs> three to five years in Denmark, and then they go abroad and work in their home country. But then they have good news about Denmark, where they are. Mm-hmm. And they, they convince their employer to buy Danish technology. So what's not to like? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and who so will build the wind farms in <laughs> Poland then? Mm-hmm. How how can we attract people to Poland? I think you can because you you have a big market coming, and you okay. will need a lot of people. Yeah. So with cooperation, I think we can solve it. Okay. So I I don't think we can put up mm-hmm. b- barriers sure. uh, in the world. I, I think it's <laughs> impossible. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree in terms of this is a really global opportunity and we won't be able to stop that sort of tide, if you like, of people coming and going. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it was another point that was made earlier around not looking at just the offshore worker, but looking at the, the whole family, the experience and what you're inviting them to come to. Um, so, you know, from our perspective, you know, I've got a lot we can say around the, the amazing environment, the wider opportunities in the economy and, um, you know, the opportunities for their young people. So, you know, I think there's just a messaging there and, that, you know, that we've got to be careful we don't go into the silo approach and looking at offshore wind in isolation. It's about transforming regional economies throughout the EU. So it's thinking about it that as the driver in that sense. Mm-hmm. I can reinforce that the prospect of a solid market is very, very important, um, whatever it is. That will drive uh, workers to actually settle where the market is, 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 is going to be, is going to develop. And in addition to that, the, uh, the, the benefits that uh, working in an industry of an offshore wind should be by far more highlighted uh, if we want people to actually be convinced that this is an industry that they see a future and they see a career. We would like to move the uh, focus on jobs uh, into careers. Mm-hmm. People would like to get into offshore wind to build a career in the long term rather than just to get a job. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much, and uh, we have just uh, got to the end of, of the panel. Quite quite many insights. I will not try to summarize everything, but I would <laughs> like to to kind of, for me, the takeaway is the cooperation within the country, wi- between businesses, training centers, local authorities, also national authorities, but also across the countries in order to to get this benefit of uh, from the front runners and try to try to ensure that you can upskill more quickly rather than build the whole the whole ecosystem if you like skills ecosystem from the scratch i think that another takeaway is that we need all types of education vo- vocational for reskilling but also also uh, uh, bachelor and master and phd because again i mean we discussed the issue of teachers 
uh, teaching the teachers. And uh, the final thing is that we need to scale all this up very, very quickly. We have seen the figures, we have seen the ambition. Uh, and if we are to deliver, and I think we all do share, uh, share the view on the benefits of, of all this offshore to be built from the environmental point of view, from the energy system point of view, from the economic point of view, growth, jobs, etc., etc. We need to do it very, very quickly. With this I finish, I would like to ask for big applause to our speakers. <laughs> and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.